Amen. Well, last week <clears throat> I was um, talking to a friend of mine at work, and she has been a Christian for a long time, and she asked me a question. She said, you know, Dave, I went to hear this speaker. She went to the Ark like two weeks ago. They had a whole group of speakers at the Ark down in Tennessee. And this one woman was up there, and she said every two minutes she was saying, well, the Lord told me this, and the Lord said this, and the Lord told me that, and God said this. And she's like, I'm sitting there next to my friend thinking, well, God doesn't talk to me that much. Is this woman making this up? or I mean, what's going on? Are we missing out on something? So that kind of sparked, this is, this is an old sermon, okay? I'm just going to be honest with you. And some of you, many of you here have heard me present this before. But because of the times that we're living in, I think now more than ever, we need divine guidance. If ever we needed to hear from God, it's now. So my message today is entitled, Hearing the Voice of God. So I want to start out by asking a number of questions. The first question I'm going to ask you is, is there a God? Now, I don't have time to go into all the... the uh, arguments against that foolish question other than to say in Psalm 53 verse 1 the fool hath said in his heart there is no God and I'm not calling them a fool God's calling them a fool and if you think that everything in existence came out of nothing you're a fool that's foolish nothing ever came out of nothing and to think that the intricacies of this physical universe, your body that you're living in, the solar systems, everything that's around us just appeared one day out of nowhere. Nobody made it happen. Well, then, my friend, I'm sorry. According to the one who made everything, he says, if you believe that, you're a fool. That's foolish. So that question, we're just going to settle. Yes, there is a God. But the next question is, if there is a God, or since there is a God, do you think God can talk? Well, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 2, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. So, yes, there is a God, and yes, of course, he can talk. I, I love the scripture that says, Is the maker of the eye unable to see? Is the maker of the ear unable to hear? Now, it doesn't say this, but following in that same premise, is the maker of the tongue unable to speak? Of course he can talk. All right, so since there is a God, and since we know he can talk, here's the question. Do you think God would ever talk to people? Yes. Isaiah 52, verse 6, Therefore my people shall know my name, Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that speak. Behold, it is I. Of course God speaks to people. So if God speaks, who does he speak to? Well, he speaks to Moses, right? And he speaks to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Samuel. Those are the kind of people he speaks to. And all the prophets of the Old Testament, Jeremiah and Daniel, he speaks to them, right? But... Do you think God would ever talk to me? God would ever talk to you? Do you think that's a possibility? Amen. John chapter 10, verse 27, this is what Jesus said. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus is the great shepherd. The 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And shepherds have sheep. If you don't have sheep, you're not a shepherd. But the great shepherd, Jesus, has sheep. And who are his sheep? Those that follow him. So Jesus said, if you're following me, you're one of my sheep. And you will hear my voice. I didn't say this. He said it. And God cannot lie. When you think about it, it's not really a matter of God's ability to talk as much as it is our ability to hear. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, this is one 
of the seven times God says this to uh, John in the Isle of Patmos. He says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And then he goes on to say, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Just a side note, there's a paradise waiting for you. It's not here in this life, but in the next. And he's saying, I'm speaking to the church, but is the church listening? Now, just like Jesus said, there's none so blind as those who will not see. Some people, you can try to explain something to them, and you can almost see it going one ear and out the other. They just don't get it. Well, it's the same thing. God is speaking to those that are following him, but are we listening? Do we have those spiritual ears to hear? Now, before I continue, i got to start by giving you a warning, okay? In the realm of trying to, we believe there's a God, we believe he can talk, he talks to people, and he talks to who? The people that are following him. But I just want to give you a warning, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 10, it says, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them are without signification. That word signification in the Greek means without importance. Today, with social media and all the technology we have, there are thousands of voices on your phone, on your laptop, your computer, the internet, the, uh, the television, cable, radio, all kinds of publications, there's newsletters. Everybody's got their significations, their importance, their opinion that they want to dump on you. You're driving down the street, you even see billboards. They got something to say to you. Every day, just walking through life, you're being bombarded with all kinds of voices and ideas and opinions. And here, buy this. Think this way. Vote this way. Go here. Don't do this. And we're just being overwhelmed with all these voices. There's many kind of voices. So where, is these, where are these voices coming from? Many of them, like the ones I just mentioned, are coming from other people. Everybody's trying to get you to go along and join their agenda. But another place where we hear voices is from ourself. Uh-oh, are you talking to yourself? No, I don't talk to myself. Yes, you do. We talk to ourselves. And you may say, well, I don't talk to myself. I'm not schizophrenic. I believe that when we're born, is that coochie coo cute little baby, you know, that doesn't know anything, can't feed itself, messes all over itself, you got to teach it how to walk. These little babies, which all of us were at one time, are born with a blank tape loop. And the things that we experience in life, and the majority of it comes from our parents, or the lack thereof, they feed information in our tape loop. I read this, this example once. This uh, young man was raised in a family where everybody was vegetarians. And then they later became vegans. Well, when he ventured out on his own, got his own apartment, his mom and dad weren't around, and he went out and he got a hamburger and he ate a cheeseburger. And it sure tasted good, but boy, inside did he feel guilty because he felt like the voices that were programmed in his head, mom and dad would be mad at me. It's wrong. They told me how wrong it is to eat animals, and here I'm eating a cheeseburger. And he condemned himself. Now, God didn't condemn him. I don't condemn them. I eat cheeseburgers all the time. Can't you tell? <laughs> but he did that to himself. And because we go through different experiences, we tell ourselves different things. And sometimes we can't trust the things we tell ourselves because we were fed false information. Now, one of the other voices, and I hate to say this to you, but if I don't tell you this, I wouldn't be telling you the truth, is there's a devil. There's a devil out there. Satan is alive and well and living on planet Earth, and he is a liar. Jesus said he was a liar from the very beginning, and he will lie to you. Now remember what Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, 
the thief, meaning the devil, he has three things in store for every human being. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal everything you've ever had, any blessing God's ever given you. He wants to kill you deader than dead. And then he wants to destroy even the memory of you. So he's going to whisper all kinds of things. Oh, come on and do this. It would taste good. It would smell good. It would feel good to just lead you astray. And then he's going to lie to you because his goal is nothing but to destroy. So you have to be aware that he's out there and his voice is one of the voices that's being circulated. And then, of course, the other voice comes from God. Now, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, John says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. In other words, every voice that comes to you. Don't believe them all, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Do you think there's any false prophets in the world today? Just go on YouTube. There's thousands of them, and they all heard from God. Well, how do you know which one's right and which ones are wrong? The Word of God says to try the spirits. If you go to a jeweler and you say, well, my Aunt Maud, she died and left me this, this diamond ring with, made out of gold. Can you test it and see if it's real? You know what that jeweler is going to say? Oh, yeah, I'll just believe you. Here, I'll give you $1,000 for it. No. He's got this funny little thing he sticks in his eye to check to make sure that that diamond is real. And then he will test that metal. He will try it. He will test it to see is that real gold or is it fool's gold? Is it 20 carat, 18 carat? What is it? He's going to test it. He's not just not going to take it at face value. Well, it looks nice. Yeah, I'll give you a thousand. Here you go. No, he's going to test it. And what we need to do all the voices, all the theologies, the philosophies, the opinions that come at us trying to lead us in their direction, just don't go with every wind of doctrine. Just don't get blown around with whoever said what. You test it. You try it. And God says that's what we're supposed to do. I've told you this a million times. When I'm up here speaking, just don't say, well, it's got to be that way. Pastor Dave said so. No. You test every word I say, because if what I say is not scriptural, then guess what? I'm wrong. And it's your responsibility then to come to me and say, Pastor Dave, you said this, but it's not scriptural. Would you explain this to me? We keep each other in check by doing that, because I'm not perfect and neither are you. And like I always say, it doesn't matter what you say, and it doesn't matter what I say. It only matters what God says. And we have to try those spirits. Now in 1 Corinthians 12.10, Paul gives a list of the gifts of the Spirit to the church. And one of them, it says, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits. And that word discerning in the Greek means to separate thoroughly. When you hear a voice, or you get an idea, or you get a thought, one of the gifts that God has given those that are following him is this gift of discernment, this feeling inside that, that just, you know, like the old saying, trust your gut. Well, if you're a born-again Christian, trust your gut. He's giving you the ability to separate thoroughly and say, That's not, that sounds good, but it's not right with God. There's a way that seems right unto a man, Solomon said, but the end thereof is the way of death. This is important stuff. We have to know who's trying to lead us and for what reason. All right, so how are some of the ways that God does speak to us? First of all, the most powerful, the most dependable, the most accurate way God speaks to us is through his word. Get yourself one of these Bibles, okay? And I'm not one of those that say you have to have one translation or the other, but the most accurate, closest, translated English version is the King James Version. All right, I'm not saying you're, if you read another version, you're wrong, but if you're going to 
to you're going to debate somebody doctrinally. There's a lot of things I can debate you in a King James that you're not going to find in the other translations. But get yourself a Bible that you can understand to begin with, okay? And then that word from Genesis to Malachi and from Matthew to Revelation. And the reason I say that is because some Bibles have what's called the Apocrypha in the middle. And the Apocrypha are words that are not the Word of God. They're actual historic books that were written between the 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. And you can learn some historical information, but it's not scriptural. It's not something you can stand on. It's not a rock you can build your house on. And then outside of Revelation, there's all kinds of what they call the Gnostic Bibles and all these other so-called writings. And again, you can get some information, but you can't build a house on it. And then I've been getting sent a lot of videos lately where people are quoting from the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, and the book of Jubilees. And these books are mentioned in the Bible, but they're not scripture. And some of those books that you go on Amazon.com and say, I want the book of Enoch, I want the book of Jasher, are they really the exact ones that God has mentioned in Scripture? But, th again, you can gain some good information, but you can't hang your hat on it. So if you want, from Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to Revelation, Old and New Testament, if you read that, you will never go astray. That is the word of God. Jesus said, heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my word will never pass away. Amen. That's something you can stand on and you can just relax. You know this voice is coming from God, and I can trust that. The other way God speaks to us is from what you're doing right now, listening to people preach. Now, Every time I preach on Sunday and every time I teach on Wednesday, I always pray, Lord, number one, most important, what I'm saying, I mean, I'm a mere mortal trying to present the word of God. I mean, who am I to do that? But I just pray, Lord, let my words be your words and let your words be my words. Don't ever let me bleed my opinion into things. The other way God speaks to us is through stories. And examples. One of the reasons that I always, after we take the offering and I do announcements before I start preaching, I ask, does anybody have anything they want to share? Now, I don't do that just to fill up time and space. I do that because your testimony or something that God did in your life is an encouragement to other people. You know, we all come to church on Sunday and we, you know, we took a shower, we got our nice clothes on and we smile. Oh, hallelujah. My life's perfect. How's yours? But the rest of the week, we're in pain. We're lonely. We're doubting things. You don't know what's going on in somebody else's life, in their heart, in their mind. And you could stand up and say something that is actually going to encourage that other people or that other person in a way you didn't even know they needed. And when we hear other stories and testimonies and different examples that people have gone through, you know what the Bible really is? Pretty much the entire Old Testament and the book of Acts and the New Testament, it's just a book of examples and stories. Remember the old saying, a wise man learns from his mistakes where a fool only lives to repeat them? But a truly wise man learns from other people's mistakes. If I see you stick your hand in a fire and you scream, ow, that's hot, and I look and all the flesh is gone, now if I'm stupid, I'll say, well, let me see if it does the same thing for me, and I stick my hand in there. <laughs> well, I will learn, don't put your hand in the fire. But if I'm truly wise, I looked and I saw what happened to you when you stuck your hand in the fire, and I'm going to go, hey, maybe I shouldn't do that. Well, that's what most of the Old Testament is, is a lot of stories to show how people lived their lives and what the results were of that and to think, hmm, maybe I shouldn't do that. Or maybe I should live like Samuel or like Daniel. And I shouldn't live like Nebuchadnezzar. 
So that's another way God speaks to us. This doesn't happen very often, but God does, from time to time, speak to people audibly. Now, I've never been privileged to see Jesus face to face, where some people have. Jesus has appeared to them. If you don't believe me, ask Saul of Tarshish on the road to Damascus. He got knocked off his horse and he saw Jesus. There's, there's stories of Muslim men around the world who Jesus, the Quran calls him um, Esau. He appears to them, showing them that he's still alive. But I have had the privilege, under a very terrible time in my life, I did audibly hear Jesus speak to me once. And that does happen. It's not common, and it usually happens when you're in a time where you're in a desperate situation. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, there's a man named Moses. And you know the story of Moses, but he's now in the land of Goshen, thinking, all right, I finally got out of Egypt. I'm just going to be a shepherd and live with my wife and raise my kids and just be a shepherd. But then he sees this bush on fire, but it wasn't consumed. And he's got to check it out. So he climbed up Mount Sinai to look at this, and he hears the audible voice of God. And in Exodus 3.14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now, Moses, it was going to take a lot to get him out of the comfort of Goshen to go back to Egypt where he was thrown out and to stand up to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the civilized world at that time, and say, let my people go. And when Pharaoh says, yeah, who should I, or why should I do that? Who sent you? He knows that he knows that he knows he heard the voice of God. And he says, I am that I am, said, let my people go. And you know the story. After the plagues of Egypt, he finally let God's people go. But it took Moses audibly hearing the voice of God. Now the way that Jesus, when he says, my sheep hear my voice... This is the way that he speaks to most people. And he'll even speak to people that are not following him in this same manner. Remember the story of Elijah. Elijah, you know, stood up against the 400 prophets of Baal and, you know, said, I'm tired of hearing you guys belly aching about Baal's this great God. Let's finally put it to a show. And you know the story. The fire came down and consumed uh, Elijah's offering and then wiped out all 400 prophets of Baal. Well, then he heard that Jezebel, King Ahab, had a wife called Queen Jezebel, and she was after him. And he took off out of town, and he ran a, a whole day's journey, and he went and hid in a cave, and he was scared. He's shaken in his boots from this one woman. Stood up against 400 prophets of Baal, just fine. But one woman, see you ladies, you don't know how much power you have over us. And he's hiding in the cave, and he's thinking, that's it, I quit. I'm the only one that's serving God. I'm just going to hide in this cave till I die. And God says, I got bigger things for you to do than hide in this cave. So outside the door of the cave, there's a whirlwind, probably a hurricane, but it says God wasn't in the hurricane. Then there was an earthquake, and the whole ground shook, and it was probably a 0.10 on the Richter scale, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And in 1 Kings 19.12, it says, after the earthquake, a fire. And it was probably, it wasn't just a big lighter, it was probably a blazing fire. And it says, but God was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And God was in the still, small voice. And he said to Elijah, he says, don't give up. You're not the only one serving me. I always have a remnant. I always have a group of people that love me and will serve me, no matter what's going on around them. 
And that is the way when Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Now he can speak to us in all these other ways, but the majority of the time, the way God speaks to his sheep, his followers, is something called a still, small voice. And you may think, well, what is that? It's that voice that you just, you feel inside. And you just, you know, we call it a conscience. The trouble with a conscience, like I remember I told you the story a million times. When I was a little kid, my mom made uh, a dozen cookies, chocolate chip cookies. And she pulled them out of the oven and put them on top of the stove. And she said, now, Dave, you don't touch these cookies. They're hot. When they cool off, I'll give you one. And I said, okay, Mom, I won't. And she left the room. Well, guess what? I went over and ate a cookie. And boy, was it good. But the trouble is, she made 12 cookies. Now there's 11. There's a big spot missing. So I ate two more, thinking that my mom would think, oh, I only threw nine in there instead of 12. And I had to make it look even and uniform. So I ate three, two, three cookies. And my mom came in the kitchen, and I'm wiping the cookie crumbs off my face. Dave, did you eat those cookies? Mm-mm, not me, Mom. No, I didn't. And my mom's just smiling at me like, yeah, sure, uh-huh. <laughs> God gives us a conscience. But as we go through life and as we do things, we can rationalize almost anything, and our conscience gets seared with a hot iron. So after a while, like when I used to be a thief, I would go and take whatever I wanted, throw it in the trunk of my car, and then sell it, and that's how I made a living. And I could rationalize that, that those rich people out there, they shouldn't have all those nice things when I have so little, and I could rationalize being a thief. But then there's a category when you continue to go down that degraded slope where you have a reprobate mind, which... The word reprobate means detestable. You could do anything, kill, murder, steal, and it means nothing to you. So the reason I'm saying that is we can't always trust our conscience because we don't know how it's been tainted. But that still small voice comes from God. Amen. Now, how do we judge if we get this inner idea, this thought, or this feeling how do we judge to know if it's really from God or maybe I just ate too many tacos last night before I went to bed? How do I know? First of all, God never goes contrary to his word. In Numbers 23, verse 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. God never lies. You know, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, well... If God can do anything, can he make a rock so big that he can't pick it up? How stupid. I just tell him, who said God can't do anything? There's a lot of things God can't do. He can't lie, and he can't go contrary to his word. And God will never go contrary to his word. So if you get a still, small voice telling you to do something, and it's not scriptural, it's not from God. I don't care how good it feels, how many goosebumps you get, if you see an angel, if there's halos all around you. I don't care. If it's not lining up with the word of God, it is not of God. Paul tells us Satan is transformed as an angel of light. And if he is, his ministers are transformed as ministers of righteousness. If you're listening to a preacher or a teacher and somebody's saying something and they're even given scripture, but somehow inside it just doesn't feel right, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Years ago, I used to be a chemical salesman. And I worked for an exterminator. And um, one Friday, I came back from all these um, places I had to go survey. And I came back to the office, and the, it was closed. And I just wanted, I sat at my desk. I wanted to get done with my paperwork so I could then go and have a relaxing weekend. So I'm thinking I'm in an empty building, and I'm doing all this paperwork. And I hear this noise coming from the back storage room. And I thought, there's nobody here. So I went back there, and there was this young guy named Mark, one of the technicians. And I go, oh, Mark, what are you? I didn't know you were here. What are you doing here? Now, Mark said he was a Christian, and we talked a number of times. But 
I said, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm just taking some things out here off, out of the storage room, and I'm putting them in my truck. And I go, oh, you got a big job you got to do Monday morning? He says, no. He says, I'm just taking these for myself. I go, what? And he says, oh, it's all right. God told me I can do it. He says, because I think that they, the company should be paying more than what they are now, so I'm just taking enough and selling it to make up the difference for how much I think they should be paying me. And I said, and God told you to do that? He goes, yeah, yeah. God never goes contrary to his word. God will never wake me up and say, you know what, Dave? We think you should have more money. Now, you just go down the street here. There's a 7-Eleven and just show them your gun and tell them to give you what they got because they already got too much. And we'll just, God's never. If you get an idea, a thought, or a still small voice, and it's contrary to his word, you rebuke it and go the other way. The other thing to remember is God is not a blabbermouth. One word from Jesus can change your life forever. So some people say, well, God told me to do this, and then God told me to do that, and he told me what movie to watch and what to drink for breakfast and you know what to wear, and, and God tells me everything. Well, all right, when I was like three years old, and I lived in East Detroit, my mom had to hold my hand, and I look at that street now, and it was just a suburb in East Detroit, and she stood me on the corner, she says, now look both ways, and then make sure there's no cars coming, and then we'll walk across the street, and then I could go play with my friends, Denny and Josie. And I said, okay, mom, and we walked across the street. Now, if my mom was doing that to me when I was 27, something's wrong. <laughs> And if you've been following Jesus for more than a half an hour and he's got to walk you through, Jesus doesn't care what shoes you buy Amen. as long as you can afford them and you don't steal them. And he doesn't care how you cut your hair or what kind of clothes you wear as long as you're not wearing, you know, devil worshiping stuff or something. God's not a blabbermouth. Remember, in between Malachi and Matthew, God did not say one word to the planet Earth for 400 years. 1 Corinthians 14.33, and I'm almost done, I promise here. It says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. If you hear something that you think is from God and it's confusing, God's not the author of confusion. Now, it doesn't mean God tells you something. Does, you may not totally understand it all, but if it's confusing or it's totally irrational, that's not from God. God is a God of peace. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. If you get a word from God and it makes you all tied up and bound up in a knot and you just, you're so afraid and you feel condemned and you feel just, that's not from God. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom. Jesus said, I've come to set the captives free. And when God gives you a word or tells you something or gives you direction, there's going to be a, oh, okay, everything's going to be all right. I know what to do now. I got an idea. And if anything other than that, it's not from God. Colossians 3.15. How many times have you heard me say this? And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. When you have a decision to make, like I've said before, you're nowhere in your Bible is it going to tell you, do I buy, you need a new car. Do I buy the green GM or the, the red Ford. You're not going to see it in the Bible anywhere. But it's important. You need a new car. Now, you GM people say, well, you, of course you get the GM. And you Ford people say, of course you're going to get the Ford. But how? which way do I go? Well, you pray about it. Lord, I need a new car. And he's going he's gonna to guide you. And when you have a decision to make, you just you just pray about it and just do I have a peace inside I've been offered different vehicles I've been offered a lot of different things in my life but I think about if I take that somehow I just don't feel at peace inside I don't know how to describe it you know there's just like a turmoil but other things or other decisions sometimes 
I have to do something I don't want to do, but I feel if I do this, I'll have a peace about it. Just that word govern, let the peace of God rule your heart means to govern. Let that be your guiding force as if you have peace about it. And if you don't have peace, even though you don't understand, I'll tell you a story real quick because it's applicable. There was a man who bought a big giant hotel in uh, downtown Mexico City. And it was a, a historical building, and it was in shambles. And I think he paid like a million dollars for it. And he invested like three million to refurbish it. Well, it started to grow and flourish, and all these people came in, and they wanted to stay there. Well, these investors said, oh, wow, that's great. Let's buy this from the guy. So he bought it for a million, put in three million, so he's got at least four million into this. They said, we'll give you $10 million for it. And he's thinking, this is a true story. I'm not making this up. And this guy said, yeah, but if I hang on to it, I'm young, and if I hang on to it, I could make much more than that. But somehow, he was a Christian man, and he was praying. Somehow, he just didn't have a peace about hanging on to it, even though he didn't really want to sell it. But he went to sleep that night, and he had a dream, and he's rolling all over, and he just couldn't sleep. He just, it was nagging at him. He didn't have a peace. And he, so the next morning, he gets up, and he calls these investors, and he says, okay, I'll do it. I'll sell it to you for $10 million. Well, after the paperwork is all drawn up and he signs the paperwork and the ink dries and they give him the money, it's deposited in his account. Two days later, there was an earthquake in downtown Mexico City, one of the worst they had, and it leveled that building to rubble. And he's saying, wow, I'm really glad I listened to that. Now, do you think God was surprised? God knew there was an earthquake coming there. I'm not saying God caused that earthquake, but he knew about it. And that man came out $7 million ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, $6 million ahead because he just listened to that still small voice and he had a peace and he followed it and let that rule him. And then something else that's very important to know in hearing the voice of God Sometimes, you know, you go to church or you read a book or somebody tells you a story or something about God and you just feel all condemned. Like, oh, wow, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not a good person. You know what? If you're not a good person, congratulations. You're in the right place. None of us are, okay? There's none righteous. No, not one. Yeah, but you don't know how bad my sins are. Yeah, well, you don't know how bad my sins are. We're all in the same boat but if you hear a voice or an idea or a philosophy or a teacher and you feel condemned, that's not God. Because in Revelation 12.10, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The accuser will accuse you and say, you're no good. You're a lousy sinner. God would never want nothing to do with you. Look at how good all these other people are. There's no hope for you. Now, this is what my Bible says in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How much condemnation? No, none. Now, you may say, oh, good, so I can do whatever I want, and God's not going to condemn me. No, no, no. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation says, you did wrong, there's no hope, just give up and die, kill yourself, and jump off a bridge. Remember what he wants for you? Steal, kill, and destroy? Conviction says, you know what you're doing is wrong. You know you can do better than this. And conviction says, come on, let's get back on the narrow road and let's do better together. I'll walk with you. And, you know, something you have to remember, that the greatest cheerleader you will ever have in all of your existence is God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. They're cheerleaders. 
Jesus said, I didn't come to, to this world to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. I came to remove condemnation. And if we, you know, like Peter, when he got in front of Jesus after he filled his fish, his boat with so many fish, he realized his sin and he said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And what did Jesus say? Yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. I don't want you anymore. No, Jesus said, come and follow me. When we feel convicted, it's because God's shown us how much we need a Savior. And he's the Savior. Conviction says, come on, get up out of the ditch. You can do better. Condemnation says, no hope, give up, quit, and die. So if you hear that voice, it's the devil trying to steal and destroy from you, and you rebuke it. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. So, maybe I've convinced you. All right, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. How do I do all things? Because I'm so strong, because I'm so smart, because I'm so rich, because I'm so good looking. No, because I'm holding on to Jesus. Amen. And I can do anything as long as I'm doing it with him. Amen. Now, hopefully I've convinced you that maybe there is a God, that he can talk, he talks to people, and that he even wants to talk to you. So, all right, how do we get ready for this? I'm going to, all right, I'm going to put you to the test, God. I want you to talk to me this week. So how do we get ready for that? Well, first of all, we got to be good enough, right? And you got to give all your money to the poor, and you got to do 100 push-ups. Baloney. Baloney. All right, this is what you do. Psalm 1017. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou will prepare their heart and thou will cause thy ear to hear. You know how you hear from God? First of all, humble yourself and realize you're the potter and I'm just the clay. You're the Savior and I'm the sinner. I need you and I humble to you and I acknowledge that. And I'm asking you, even though I, I don't, I'm not worthy and I don't deserve it. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? There's one coming after me. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. And I'm not even unworthy, I'm not even worthy to untie John the Baptist's shoes, let alone Jesus' shoes. But still, by faith, I'm asking you, the living God, to speak to me. And he said he will prepare our hearts to get ready to cause our spiritual ears to hear. I love this scripture in Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 21. And thy ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. If you're listening, God will guide you in every direction. And you'll say, No, 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 don't, don't take that road, take this road. And, and you'll, it, it takes practice. You know, I'm, I've never been a great basketball player. One thing is my height. The other thing is I can't jump. But, you know, if you want to be a good basketball player, you got to practice. you got to practice. You want to be a good anything, you got to practice. You want to hear the voice of God, you got to practice. But you got to first prepare your heart for the possibility that this incredibly awesome God wants to speak to me you got to prepare your heart for that. And then, after you've done it over time, you'll get to the point where you just know God's saying don't go this way, God's saying go that way. You'll hear a, you'll hear a word in your heart in that still small voice. And then Psalm 46 and verse 10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will, exalt, I will be exalted in the earth. Take time. I mean, when you first start out, it might be five minutes. It might be ten. be great the longer you can do it. Just take time in this crazy world to turn off all your electronics. Don't read anything. Just be alone. I mean, the weather is beautiful now. Be, go outside. 
Just be in the, in, the, in the woods or alongside water and just be still with the one that created you and created nature. And then get you one of these books called the Bible and open it up and just read. I don't care if it's just one verse. And just be still and know that he is God. And he'll prepare your mind. Have you ever had a situation where somebody's try, you're trying to talk to somebody, but they're preoccupied doing 10 other things, and you finally just get tired and say, ah, well, they're not going to listen, and you walk away. Well, God's not going to waste his time talking to somebody that doesn't want to listen. Mm -hmm. Take some time and be prepared to listen. John 18, verse 37. When Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, when he was about to be crucified, Pilate said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. And every one that is of the truth beareth, or I'm sorry, heareth my voice. Are you following Jesus? Do you want to know the truth about everything? You want to know the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Well, then if you listen, he says, I'm not saying this. The creator of the universe is saying, you'll hear his voice. Amen. Genesis 3.8. They heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve, after they sinned, were in the Garden of Eden, and they heard the voice of God. God was willing to keep his appointment. He walked with Adam every day in the cool of the evening. And even though he knew that they disobeyed him, he, he didn't say, oh, they're sinners. I can't be hanging around with them. I don't want nothing to do with them. He knew what they did. It was the beginning of the downfall of mankind. But he still kept his appointment, and he was there to talk to them. And he said, Adam, where are you? Do you think God didn't know where he was? He knew exactly where he was. He was giving Adam the opportunity to come and own up for what he'd done. But God wants to talk to us. And then I'll close with this. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. Remember what I said? God even speaks to people that aren't following him. 48 years ago, I was not a very nice person. I was not a very good person. I'm not that much better now, but I am a little bit better. But I heard one day, I was talking to this crazy guy in the front seat of a Volkswagen, and he was telling me about Jesus like I'd never heard before. And I could hear Jesus knocking on the door of my heart. And it says, if any man, any man, woman, or child, hear that knocking, and you open the door, I will come in and I will sup with him and him with me. And that word sup in the Greek means the most principal meal of the day. Jesus has set aside dinner for two, you and him. Yeah, but you don't know who I am. He does. Like the old saying, the one who knows me the best. Mm -hmm. He knows everything about me, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The one who knows me the best loves me the most. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, come away from everything. Just put all that pressure of life, just get rid of it. And just come and sit down with me and let me speak to you. Let me encourage you. Let me teach you how to walk with me. Because what does First John say? I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So I could talk all day about this. So I'm, I'm going to shut up so you don't have to listen to my voice. So you can prepare your hearts to listen to his voice. Let's pray.